Welcome to episode 116. The pub is open. So many things. It's There's a lot going on. So a lot going on. Um, well, with everything. I don't even know where to start. Well, what am I drinking? I'm drinking an IPA that was brought to me in Riverside, California. Backstage. Well, I lost the card. So whoever brought even par IPA La Quinta, it's made in Palm Springs. Thank you. It, yeah, it's delicious. Um, so that's what we're drinking. Um, and where have we been? Spokane. Spo, and they even put that in the all over the casino. It's pronounced Spokane. Like, wh- who, are people running around saying Spokane? I guess. Um, what worst travel weekend ever? Really? Yeah. Oh my god. It. Fifteen hours door to door Nashville. No. Yes, there was no. a freak snowstorm in the northwest. Like they, it snows in the mountains, but they all say it doesn't snow down there. Well, Spokane was not prepared for ten inches of snow. Seattle, I landed and I'm like, are you are you kidding me? Did I? Do we fly all the way to Calgary? Like this is the <laughs> snow was crazy. Thankfully, there was a bar across from the gate because they were like, oh, don't leave. We did the carrot thing all day. We're gonna leave in forty five minutes. Don't go too far. We might leave in like seven minutes. And that, but the World Cup was on, so at least I was able to pass the time. And that is why uh, I leave and make the opening act leave a day early, just in case of those things. But for the last weekend on the road, I was not prepared for that. But the casino was fabulous, Northern Quest, if you're up that way. And the people there were super nice, and the crowd was bananas great. And then El Cajon, even that crowd was even better. And then Riverside. So the shows were great. Um, the travel was just, but in the back of the Northern Quest Casino, they have this whole, well, I don't know. It looks like an outdoor arena for summer concerts and super cool. But there was, it was like 10 inches of snow. All I saw were giant, there's a giant Bigfoot ah, and uh, all this stuff. in the. It's like winter wonderland. There's a penguin on skis. It's on the Instagram video. Uh, but the Bigfoot, they weren't finished doing it because they weren't, weren't expecting to be snowed in. Uh, the Bigfoot will be popping out of a Christmas package, oh. which is just, I love that they embrace it. That's awesome. They're all in. They don't think I'm. I I feel I'm amongst my people there when it comes to the belief in Bigfoot. They're all in. Yeah. Yeah. All in. Yeah. Even if they're using it to make money, who cares? Right. It's there. They support it. They're spending a shit ton of money to build this giant thing in Bigfoot's honor. Love it. Yeah. He, he could have been bigger though. Come on. I'm just shouting I out to Northern Quest course. Casino next year. He could be bigger, right? He looks huge. It was huge, but it could be a lot. It could be bigger. Um, and San Diego, which is El Cajon. But we, I've, me and Michael flew down there. I've never seen a line that long to rent a car. Just really? had, it looked like goddamn Disney World. No. And I'm like, I don't understand why everybody's renting a car. You flew to San Diego. You're here. Isn't right. this what you were doing? Right. San Diego. But I mean, you do need one to get to Sea World and Hoopty Ha and Lottie La, I guess. I don't know. It did move fast, but I mean, it, when you're that tired to walk out and see that, you're like, Holy shit. And then Riverside, um, my uh, my agency, um, one of the best uh, assistants in the whole world, Sage, um, and uh, her friend, Car- yeah, yeah, but that's how I know her, through yeah. work, and I never got to meet her. And it, uh, it was like the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it was like the, the little Wizard of Oz. And let me tell you what, in ag- any agency, it's the assistants that have the true power. Yes. It is, because they're on top of everything. They know everything. Sage is more competent than probably 90% of the people working there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm kidding, UT. I don't mean 90%. Yeah. At least 10, though. At least. <laughs> and she had a friend carry with her, and that was fun. And uh, So, fun weekend. Now, what are, we t- what are we tasting? Well, somebody brought this to me in Welsh, Minnesota, and I forgot to taste it. There's been a lot going on, but... Um, the original top of the tater sour cream chive onion dip, no. which I do love an onion dip. Who doesn't? Yep. Let's see. Wow. Good? That's really good. Nice. I can't see where it's made, though. I can't read it. Oh, okay. St. Paul, Minnesota. Oh, nice. Yep. Mid-America Farms. <laughs> uh-huh. The original top of the tater. Well done. <laughs> And in honor of World Cup, which, by the way, I watched um, the uh, Korean game yesterday against uh-huh. Brazil. I mean, I felt bad for the Koreans. Like, there should be a way where you get to resign or quit. <laughs> like, if they, I mean, 
Finally, <laughs> Korea, it was uh, one to nothing, two to nothing, three to nothing, four. It was like watching Brazil play, I don't know, a St. Louis high school team. And I've so but I'm like, well, they must not be horrible. They made it this far. Maybe, I don't know if Brazil is just that good or if Korea is that bad or somewhere in the middle, but, uh, I don't know. A Korean scored the goal in the second half, so he can tell his grandkids I scored a, g- a goal against Brazil. So yeah. one guy's happy, but I mean, for nothing, <laughs> these are World Cup <laughs> potato chips in honor. Lay's jalapeno poppers. Now you know my feelings. Bacon wraps, jalapeno poppers. Oh, bacon wrap. Yeah. yeah. You know my feelings on doing this. I don't think you should mess with greatness, but. Wow. Yeah. I've never okayed. A Lay's potato chip outside the original. I'm okay in these. No. Yep. Yes. They're really good. Uh, mm-hmm. I give that an A plus. Whoa. Yep. Oh. Yeah. It's and then, huh? Well, these were brought backstage. You know, I have notes on this stuff. Sasquatch surprise potato chips. <laughs> See, they don't give up. That's why I love them. Smokehead is where I met Carlita and Lynn. Um. The Gonzaga gang up there, and um, Sandy made me goldfish, and she sp- seasoned herself. They were delicious. I ate all of them. Oh my God. They're gone. I can't even show you those. I'm seeing if I know who brought these Sasquatch things. I don't. But anyway, Tim's, <laughs> and here's Bigfoot, extra thick and crunchy, gluten-free. Oh, I can send them to my sister Wonderful. after I eat half the bag. Wow. Yeah. Hashtag we are PN. W Pacific Northwest. Well, yeah. How funny would it be if I ate three fourths of this bag and mailed the rest of my sister? Just <laughs> mailed it. Or just an empty bag. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look. Here's your gluten free chips. <laughs> All right. Enjoy four of them. So, <laughs> thank you to everybody who came. They were all sold out. Uh, it was so fun. Made money. Had fun. Thank you. A little time off. Yes, a little time off with a lot of still work to be done, but not road work. At least it's home. In my pajamas with baby cat. So that's great. Yeah. They did not like me being gone that long. How's your tree? My Christmas tree is great. My brother's is pathetic. <laughs> he went out of town to his wife's family on the East Coast, and it's now you got to buy them before <laughs> Thanksgiving because if you wait and you get back, for the big ones anyway, it's the big so- ones are gone. Yeah. And he just moved to a bigger house. And his trees keep getting smaller. It looks it looks like he's doing a reverse miniature. Uh, it's so tiny they had to build a platform for the train. No. Yes. He waited too long. Lesson learned, Patrick. He's Mr. Christmas. Get your uh, He is Mr. Christmas. I know. So it's going to be it's he's Mr. Christmas from the outside, but then on the inside. Epic fail. Then he's he's miniature Christmas. He <laughs> He's tiny Christmas. He's tiny Christmas. You have to go if you want a real one. You want a big one. I'm telling you. That is true everywhere I've been. And I don't know why. And then somebody told me at one of the tree lots, Norms, uh, that they don't have enough help to cut the trees down. Oh, is that the problem? That's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's more to the problem, but that's the part I'm aware of. I got a a purple flock one. You got a purple flock? I saw one of those. so cool. Wow. I don't know if I could break the tradition. I've seen the red ones, and then I think that's a little satanic, you know. I but not. It's a Christmas color. The purple's weird. I like the flocking. I flock a wreath. Yeah, that's a Libra sensible <laughs> decision. You'd hate my tree. I like the flock tree, but I don't think I can commit to it. But I can commit to a flocked wreath that's white on the door with a red ribbon. It's like there's a unicorn in my living room. Well, a purple. My niece would like it. Yeah. She loves purple. She can have it. A purple. I'll get it. <laughs> well, you could get a small one and flock it. No, they won't do that. No, they only flock big ones? Yeah. Well, no that's way. ridiculous. If they'll do the wreath, why not do the small one? I don't know. I'm not in charge of that. All right, we're moving on to Queen News. <gasps> well, first, on a sad note, Christine McVie died of Fleetwood Mac. Mm-hmm. That's when I was sitting in the Seattle airport, and it was trending Christine McVie, and I went, oh, no, because she never trends. Because she's quiet. Um, normal. She seems to be a normal person. Yeah, they don't say what a, a short illness. But this is where people, then of course, a short, she dies of a short illness. Everybody's like, I bet she died of, she, of the vaccine, right? All the people that say she died of the vaccine. Can we all just remember 
She was 80. Yeah. I mean, 79, soon to be 80. Like, you, like my mom says, the flu can kill you at that age. Just the regular old flu could kill you. Right. Pneumonia could kill you. When, when Lewis a long time ago got pneumonia, I Googled pneumonia in people over 65. Holy shit, you don't even want to Google that. Um, so who knows what she died of, but it was very sad. Even though Stevie's my favorite, now the chain is broken. Oh, oh that's right. I said it. The chain is broken. There can never be Fleetwood Mac again. Because we could exchange the bass player or the guitar player. We could exchange John McVie. We could ex- you can't exchange Mick, Christine, or Stevie. Those are the three to, that really, I mean, you could, but I don't think as many people will go. Well, and it's not the same. We could switch our friend Dax yeah. for Cheap Trick. Yeah. Uh, he could leave Cheap Trick and and voice. switch out for Mick Fleetwood. Yeah. Yeah. And he has a voice he can sing. Yeah. Mick doesn't sing at all. His drum solo would be better. His drum solo w- would be better and not so self-involved. Yeah. Mick oh. Fleetwood's at last like eight hours. Yeah. Me, and then he comes out from behind the drums and plays drums on his body. He's yeah. got those things inside his shirt. And just when you think, oh, good, this is over. <laughs> he gets up and says, oh, my God, he's still going. <laughs> So that was sad for Stevie, I'm sure. She posted a sad little thing um, about all that. But in in more exciting queen news, Mm -hmm. Cher has a 36-year-old boyfriend. No! Yeah! Yeah. He's very cute. Well, I mean, I always think it's bizarre when people... (laughs) How many... She's 76, I'd say. 40-year difference. What do they have in common? Uh, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. He's a music executive. His name is Alexander A.E. Edwards, which sounds way too much like A.G. Edwards. Yeah. But I guess that doesn't bother him. He's very cute. Uh, She confirmed the relationship on Twitter while defending his, quote, intentions. She recently shared a photo of Alexander sitting in his underwear with the caption, A.E. hanging out. Come on. I think it's ridiculous to date somebody 40 years younger than you. I mean, I can barely talk. To people in their twenties, without really just going, yeah, I, I gotta go. Yeah. I but 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 uh, dudes do this all the time. Yep. So to even out the playing field, I'm glad one lady is admitting it and doing it. Yeah. Uh, in a reply to a Twitter user asking for relationship advice, she said that AE came after me till we met in the middle and is the consistent partner in their relationship, where she is the skittish partner. Oh. Ladies, never give up. She wrote. While also saying he's different from me. Um, I hope so. Neither one wanted to make long trip. And then she uses a lot of emojis when she tweets. And then there's an airplane. Trip to Paris. Then Paris was magic. Nebi, oh, never. She meant never wanted to, I don't know, something. Must say he's different from me. He's kind, smart, and hilarious. They kiss like teenagers. On paper, this looks strange, even to me. Yeah. She wrote this separate tweet. Um, Alexander believes love doesn't know math. See? Well, here's the other one they always say. Love doesn't know math. And then they always go, but but he's an old soul. Yeah. She's an old soul. Yeah. Every guy that him. I know that's old, that's dating someone super duper young, goes, yeah, but Kathleen, she's a really old soul. If, if that's what you need to tell yourself, why don't you just say the truth? You'd rather go out with somebody smoking hot totally. than somebody... It's 70, yep. even though there's pretty 70-year-olds, but yep. they're harder to find. <laughs> harder to find, and they don't give a shit anymore. I love him because he wasn't afraid. He's kind, hilarious, smart, talented. We talk, we laugh, we're perfectly matched. Do I wish I was younger? Yeah, but I'm not boo-fucking-who. These are her words, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good for her. Let's even the score. You know, how many of these old guys are running around doing this every single day? Every day. Other queen news. <laughs> uh, I did watch Dolly's special, the Magical Cri- Mountain Christmas. It was, it's everything you would expect. But the moment where she's singing, she's in an all red outfit, sing, singing Satan Go Straight to Hell on NBC. <laughs> And then there's a guy playing Satan. It's so cheesy. It's wonderful. And then um, her great grand nephew, Liam, which is Stella's grandson, I think. uh, Yeah, for sure. 
a adorable little kid. So she's got the family in it. Good yeah. for her. Yeah, it's not a deep plot line. No. <laughs> I'm like, but this is where I'm like with NBC. You have Dolly. Could could we write just a little bit of a story? Yeah. Anybody? Right. We know she wants to sing her songs. I love too that she just plugs the shit out of her own stuff. I know. Dollywood, Dollywood. I'm like, good for you, which I have bought tickets to Dollywood. No. I want to see the lights. There's over six million Christmas lights. I'm so coming. Yeah. I'm gonna make Dorf go. Yep. <laughs> you know what, Dorf? I know you're Jewish, even though he doesn't really practice it. Um, you're going to practice being a Christian yeah. this week. Yeah. And I'm going to make him go down there, and I'm going to go make him go to the old smoky uh, moonshine distillery before Dollywood and after, because wow. I'm betting there's no alcohol in Dollywood, so we're going to have to. There's ways to mule that in. We, pff, I'm not muling it in. I'm not getting kicked out of Dollywood. I'm just going to go have a couple shots of moonshine. That would be epic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, there's different news, though, with Dolly. Um, oh, she's going to host uh, New Year's Eve with uh, Miley Cyrus. Fun. That's her goddaughter. Great. And then Billy Ray was in the um, Dolly movie, and I think Miley and Billy are fighting. So whose side does Dolly he's, take here? He's also dating a child. He's dating a child, too? <laughs> I can, we can't say child. I could get sued for that. A very young lady. Right. I can't. It's not a real child. I could get sued. <laughs> I don't think Billy Well, not that Billy's listening to this, but you, <laughs> one never knows. He should. What if he's got a Google alert on his name or something? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I think because he's dating somebody way younger. I don't know. Maybe Miley doesn't like it. Yep, they shared identical posts saying New Year's Eve co-host Dolly Parton. Dolly wished the Wrecking Ball singer a happy birthday, exclaiming she can't wait to celebrate with her, bring in the New Year. For a woman who's 76 years old, she certainly works a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah so if you guys want to watch that, yeah. um, if you got nothing to do on New Year's Eve, I hate going out on New Year's Eve. I hate it. Amateur hour. Yeah, and we don't work on... It's too hard to sell theater tickets, so I'm usually off unless it's a casino gig, um, which is absolutely fine, too. I can drink any night of the year with zero repercussions, so I'll probably be home watching it. Nice. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. Something better than... I can't watch Anderson Cooper. No. No, and then the other... I don't know. The other ones... I, I'd rather just watch a Christmas movie. Yeah. Or something. Um, speaking of what are we watching, I'd rather watch the end of Yellowstone. Yeah. But can we just talk about the amount of commercials in Yellowstone? It's ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. I mean, the show itself is probably only 18 minutes long. There are so many commercials. I thought we were kind of done with that. Yeah. Are, why don't Especially, people do more product placement? Especially if you're paying for the service. We, yes, you're paying for it. Now I'm getting ads. It's like they hoodwinked us. I know. Yeah. But I don't know how to unpay. Um... <laughs> And then I want to watch George and Tammy about Tammy Wynette and George Jones. But that guy doesn't look like George Jones at all. I'm going to really have to suspend all, all ideas because he just, I know that guy from some other show too, and he's a fine actor, but it just doesn't. He was in. Uh, he was in something. He was, he was the dad in the one about the. Uh, um, I'll find out. Okay. Moving on. Update! That's Anna Delvey. Oh. oh, she's throwing an Art Basel party f featuring her art from House Arrest. Okay, I had to Come Google. On. I had to Google what is Art Basel. Do you know what it is? No, I think it's like an art collective, isn't it? Well, it's an art something. They have shows in like Hong Kong. They're for profit. Uh -huh. So it's a group that does these shows. Well, And they always have one in Miami. So she was doing hers virtually. Um, from scam artist to actual artist. Fraudster. Stop saying fraudster. fraudster. Say thief, liar. Stupid. Yeah, it's it, it just minimizes. <sighs> liar, thief, Anna Delvey uh, Sorokin is virtually hosting an exclusive Art Basel Miami party that will feature artwork she created while on house arrest. So after serving four years in prison, she's teaming up with New York-based gallery... 
the locker room to throw the house arrest party for art collectors at a private residence in Miami, according to a press release. The 31-year-old swindler. That's another bullshit word. Yeah. Thief. Yeah. Yes. God. Who's currently serving off serving house arrest in her East Village apartment will be doing a live Q&A with attendees via Zoom. This thing, though, mark my words. Anna, uh-huh. this is going to fade. This whole thing is going to fade because it was interesting for a minute. And then people are like, nah, like the, her little drawings are fine, but no, I mean, I could fire up 10 people that could do better, but okay. Um, additionally, her masterpieces created after she served time will be displayed at the FET, the party and are available for purchase. Uh, she, an insider that could be a lie, told Page Six that one of her pieces, Prowling in Prada, is already pre-sold for $15,000. There's a lot of excitement. When is immigration shipping her out? When? I got to Google that. Write a letter. Contact your congressman. Contact my congressman about this? Yeah. I don't know who my congressman is. Oh, we can Google it. No, I guarantee you 99% of people in this country can't say who their congressman is. I can tell you who my bartender is. I can tell you who my dry cleaning lady is. Um, I can tell you the ladies that work at the post office, but I can't tell you who my congressman is. Not in either state, not in Missouri or Tennessee. Update! Trader update. It's a short one. I know I know these bore you, Paddles. No, they don't bore me. I'm happy they're... Well, the Oath Keepers leader, Stuart Rhodes, found guilty of seditious conspiracy in the January 6th attack. The only reason this one's super important is he was the guy with the patch on his eye. He was the famous one. He was the big deal. He was the pirate. Seditious conspiracy, though, hasn't been tried since in 10 years, and it's hardly ever, ever even charged. Is that what took so long? I guess. Rhodes and four, de- four co-defendants, all these women, Jessica Watkins, Kelly Meggs, Thomas Caldwell, and Ken Harrison were convicted. Uh, Meggs was the only other defendant found guilty of seditious conspiracy. The Oath Keepers is white right-wing extremist mil- militia group seeks to defend its interpretation of the U.S. Constitution against perceived enemies, if necessary, by force, according to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Yeah. <laughs> the last time the government won a guilty ver- verdict on this charge was during the 1995 prosecution of Islamic militants who plotted to bomb New York City landmarks. Huh. Mm-hmm. Until now, the Justice Department has not tried a seditious conspiracy case defined as opposing the government of the United States by force in a decade. It's a big deal. He could go up for 20 years, I think is what I read at the end. And I, I, I hope it's a while because he does not regret anything. He's sticking to his guns. So we'll see how far sticking to your guns takes you. Won't we? Won't we? Now, holy shit, we found it. I really only have one good one. A lot of people weren't digging for stuff this week. No. Maybe it's the holidays. It's the holidays. Maybe, yeah. yeah, we're not really, I know where to look for these too. Well, I mean, they just come up on my phone because now the phone knows that I want them. Medieval coin discovered in Canada, panels. Yes! Could rewrite the history books. This oh. is this is crazy. Can I just state for the record too that this guy had a metal detector and I bought my mom a medical, metal detector one year. The, one of the first years they went to Florida for the uh-huh. winter, which was probably 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, she was just so gung-ho. She had to have this yeah. <laughs> stupid fucking metal detector. And they're not cheap. Uh-huh. It was like a 1000 bucks or something. It was a lot. That's crazy. A good one. Because yeah. if you're going to do it, you might as well buy a good one. Otherwise, you're just going to be beeping for nothing out there the whole time. But anyway, this guy. And then I don't even know where it went, nor does she. I'm like, how do you lose a metal detector, Mom? Well, you know, when we did this and that and we moved and... No! I think she sold it. Really? <laughs> wow. Gambling money. To a human in person, not on eBay. She wouldn't know how to do that. Gambling money. Right, she probably, money yeah. For the boat. She probably cashed it in at the casino. How much yeah. will you give me for this? <laughs> the casino should do that. Old people would be wandering in there with all kinds of stuff every day. The government in Newfoundland and Labrador has revealed the oldest known coin ever discovered in Canada has been unearthed on one of the province's beaches. Dating back to 1422 through 27, it puts into question historians' understandings of when Europeans arrived in Canada, with ancient origins declaring it could rewrite the history books. Whoa. Yeah. 
every year Columbus just gets take further down a notch. Yeah. You, dude, there were so many people here before you. <laughs> they just didn't run back to Spain and look and Queen Isabella. Go, look, I found it. She doesn't know those other guys are there. No. There's no Twitter. No. There's no texting. No You're just taking that. this guy's word for yeah, it. There's a scroll. Yeah. <laughs> the English coin. Yeah, what about Leif Erikson? Yeah. He doesn't get any credit. The English coin was discovered by metal detectorist. I did not know that was a word. Edward Hines, during the summer of 2022, took him a bit to realize what he had. He told Saltwire Network, it was so bright yellow and really thin, and I wasn't thinking it was a gold coin. I was thinking it was almost like a tag from something or a button or something like that. I knew it was something cool. It looked interesting to me, but of course I know nothing about English medieval coins. Yeah, who would? It's not something that I would have looked into before, and I knew nothing of hammered coins. First thing I noticed was the fleur-de-lis, which is also the symbol of St. Louis, St. Louis City, Missouri. So, maybe, yeah. And then the shield, and I thought it was interesting. I just didn't know what the writing said because it was in Latin. Well, we could have given it to my brother Patrick. He was yeah. a Latin scholar, number one person in the state of Missouri when he was a teenager. How exciting. It was very exciting and shocking because there were other areas where Patrick was not excelling. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, look at him hitting it out of the park on Latin. <laughs> And then one time we went to my cousin's wedding, and the, the, it's in a Catholic church, and the whole roof was all Latin and murals. And my sister goes, is it crazy Patrick can read all that? I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. He sent a picture of it to his wife, and he put it in his bag. He said, he wound up contacting the provincial governor as mandated under the Historic Resources Act. Now, see, that's a good Canadian. Yes. He did what your fo- rule follower if you find weird shit, you call us. You don't go put it on eBay. You don't go put it on Craigslist, which is what an American would do in a hot minute. We would make a stamp with his name on it. Yeah, this guy should get his own stamp yeah. for doing that. Yep. The legislation gives province ownership of historical artifacts found within its borders and ensures the identification, protection, and rehabilitation of archaeological, paleontological, and cultural heritage sites in the province. In a press release... They said they commend Mr. Hines for recognizing the importance of protecting Newfoundland and Labrador's heritage resources by reporting his discovery of this very, very rare artifact, and I encourage others to follow his example. These types of artifacts uh, help us understand and appreciate history, blah, blah, blah. He'll get the Order of Canada. He will get the Order of Canada, and he should get the Order of Canada. My friend Jan Arden got the Order of Canada. Nice. Yeah. That's great. I don't think any of my comedian friends have gotten it. (laughs) Not yet. No. Jeremy Hotz? Nope. Nick, uh, Mike Wilmot, yep. nope. Uh, Lars. Who's the one? Lars Wolf. Well, Lars Jim Wolf. Carrey, isn't he Canadian? Yeah, he's more of an actor. More of an actor? Yeah. Well, he's a com- comedic actor. Stand-ups? Um, there's somebody I'm forgetting, a big guy that I'm forgetting. Anyway. Um, oh, Tom Green. Yeah. yeah. Tom's great. I love Tom. And he moved back to Canada. Lars should get it. Lars? Lars' car has like a half a million miles on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's driven all over Canada. Um, okay. According to Paul Berry, former curator with the Bank of Canada's Currency Museum in Ottawa, Ontario, the coin is a King Henry VI quarter noble minted sometime between 1422 and 27. At the time, it was worth a fair sum of money, one shilling and eight pence. In an interview, the guy said it came out of the ground looking like it had been minted yesterday. Wow. While he refused to reveal the exact location... Given its age and the fact that the site is not an active dig, he said he did say it was discovered in a in a beach. Oh, he went in because of the metal debt near a registered archaeological site that dates back to the 1700s. As as mentioned, the coin's discovery puts into the question the current understanding of when Europeans traveled across the Atlantic Ocean and settled in North America. The accepted history is that North Norse explorer Leif Erikson was Leif Erikson was the first one to visit over a thousand years ago in 1000 A.D. This was proven after evidence of a Norse settlement that was discovered. We've talked about this on this podcast at Lons O Meadows. Probably saying that wrong. (laughs) Following Erickson, the next recorded European explorer to arrive in Newfoundland was John Cabot in 1497. Wow. Okay, so how did this coin from 1422 get there then? Is somebody from 1497 carrying around a coin that old in his pocket? Nope. I doubt it. Nope. Just under 100 years later, in 1583, the province came under English possession and fishing operations were established along its coast. The gold coin predates Cabot's expedition by 70 years, right, and is older than half the grot coin discovered on the beach of something-something. So they're saying it should, however, be noted that those who have examined the coin 
Don't believe it was in circulation at the time it was lost, meaning that while it predates Cabot's discovery of Newfoundland, it doesn't mean it arrived in the province earlier than him. Well, why would somebody be dragging that shit around? Yeah, nobody would. It could have been in the same collection of someone who came to North America after. Oh, yeah. Not 70 years later. No. No, maybe no. 10. Yeah. But even that's a stretch. I don't know. I don't ever look at the year on my coins. I don't have <laughs> coins anymore. No. Nobody has coins. Somebody wanted coin. Somebody wanted cash on the road. And I was like, they handed me the coins back, and I just I had them in my hand like they were foreign rocks. I'm like, <laughs> okay, is there a thing for yeah. charity? We just put up. <laughs> yeah, <Charity>. I don't. <laughs> Moving on to news. Yep. This is one of my favorite stories. A troop of terrifying turkeys has been terrorizing a Massachusetts town. <laughs> the turkeys. Led, led by a ringleader named Kevin, have been pecking, <laughs> kicking, and swarming. Wait, Kevin, the turkey? Yeah, there's only one boy in this group. Come on. They've nicknamed him Kevin, which yeah. is also my nephew's name. <laughs> no, 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 no. Kevin's just a shit disturber. They're all shit disturbers. Gotcha. They're kicking and swarming residents of Woburn, Massachusetts. Now. Let's just say, I'll read a little bit, but I think the residents could step it up a bit. Okay. It's just a turkey. Yeah. It's not a cobra. It's, <laughs> no. it's, 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 not, it's not, not a Kodiak brown bear. No. 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 The city of Woburn, Massachusetts has struggled against a tenacious foe recently. A gang of five turkeys, five, who've harassed yeah. residents to the extent some are afraid to leave their house. Come on. Get a golf club. Get <laughs> an umbrella. <laughs> just b- jab it. I mean, although I've seen geese attack. It's not a joke. No. But if you, you, okay, if these guys are all over the neighborhood, then maybe you need a nine iron yeah. or a, a driver. Uh-huh. I'm not saying kill it, no. but if it's coming at you, whack it. Right. Some days it's frustrating. Oh. Woburn resident Megan Tolson remarked to the Guardian, I'll be like, oh my God, there's an Amazon package and I can't get to it because the turkeys are here. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> these, these. Yeah. As Tulsa tells it, the turkey gang is made up of four females and an aggressive male. Tulsa has dubbed him Kevin. She must have had a boyfriend or something that she didn't like named yeah. Kevin. Why? Why that's so random. random? And the females, here's their name, Monica, Esther, Patricia, and Gladys, and says that he is the ringleader. The women are more mellow and not so territorial. Wow. But I think he kind of amps it up to get him going to chase people. But they're never the instigators. When Kevin's not around, they'll just actually mind their business and walk away from you. That's what I was say. Out at the farm, there's wild turkeys everywhere. I've never had one approach me. Never. No. They're just giant birds walking around doing their own thing. Yeah. I don't even pay. I pay more attention to geese as far as what if it's going to get pissed off. A turkey? Yeah. I don't know. As CBS reports, residents of Woburn have had a number of harrowing encounters with the turkeys who peck at everything from cars to children. Wow. <laughs> Many times I've been trapped in my car and I can't get out and I have to call family members. Oh, look, they usually bring an umbrella. See, it takes a team. <laughs> um, they don't let you out of your home. They peck at cars. They go after walkers and joggers or anything like that. A lot of people will leave brooms so that they can get the turkeys out of the way if they want to leave their house because they're only active during the day and generally uh, nest up in trees or lampposts at night. Tolson is even taking to waiting till nightfall to leave her home. Wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, I'm kind of adjusted to it. I know their routine now, so I can kind of work around them. When I don't see them for a couple of days, I think, oh, no, someone has run them over. I mean, yeah, they can be a pain sometimes, but, you know, they're just turkeys. <laughs> Turkeys are native to Massachusetts, but died out in 1851 because of habitat loss. More than a century later, biologists reinduced, reinduced, introduced the birds to the state by trapping 37 turkeys in New, in New York and releasing them in Massachusetts. The turkeys have thrived, and now their numbers between 30 and 35,000. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. Yeah. According to Mass Live, there are some techniques humans can use to deal with the aggressive birds. For example, people should not feed wild turkeys, and they should not ke- and they should keep bird feeders clean. Turkeys can be scared off by li- loud noises like a hose spraying water and shiny objects wow. like car doors can make them the males aggressive. So those should be covered up or disguised. You want me to cover up my car doors? Yeah, this is a lot of hoop de yeah. over a turkey. Yeah, if they become aggressive, if pe- they can become if people feed them or they find uh, food and bird feeders, then they start to see humans as part of their flock and try to dominate them. <laughs> 
Turkey behavior starts to kick in where they become so habituated with the people that they are not really seeing the distinction. It's all about how the people respond to the turkeys. If you turn and run away, you are now subdominant. And the turkey won the battle. No! (laughs) Massachusetts, I'm going to put this one on you and say you got a man up. Yeah, a broom, a golf club. Anything. Yeah. I don't know. Some, but then, see, this is where Lewis would go. They have to be rabid because you tell me they don't do this normally. Anytime I say something like, oh, that's weird. Squirrels don't usually do that. He immediately goes to, they're rabid. We're going to be eaten. We're going to die of rabies in a hospital. And then he explains that rabies shots are super big and terribly painful. Yeah. Right. Well, that's never happened in our lives. No. No. Lewis, all these years, no. So just simmer down. <laughs> Speaking of, um, we're going to stay on animals for a minute. Okay. This is really weird. This is, do the Unsolved Mystery music. I don't remember it. I still haven't watched the one that I said I was going to watch. That's terrible, Paddle. It doesn't sound anything like it. it does. Dozens of cattle slaughtered by mystery creature that left no tracks. Wow. And you know what? These ranchers don't fuck around like that. No. They don't lie about stuff. Nope. Wait a minute. Dozens of cattle have been slaughtered by a mystery creature in Colorado that left no tracks. In October, 18 dead cows were found near the town of Meeker Steamboat. Uh, Meeker Steamboat Pilot and Today reported on Sunday. Some, not all, looked like they could have been killed by wolves, but officials from Colorado Parks and Wildlife have found no tracks or evidence of them in the area. Now, if you're watching Yellowstone, right. you would know that wolves have big ass paws and leave tons of tracks. Yeah. But whatever is killing the cows appears to still be on the rampage. Since October, oh my God, as many as 40 dead cows have been found in the same area. Wow. That's, now, somebody told me a cow is worth $7,500. Google, go, get, go Google that. that is, how much is a cow worth? Because one of my, um, somebody I used to work with, her husband was a farmer. Back then it was 5000 That was a long time ago, though. So maybe they're worth 10 now. Uh, things in Montana is slaughtered. Slaughtered. I don't want to know how much a live cow's worth. Yeah. We're raising it to slaughter it. Unless that. it's your pet. Uh, seven bucks a pound. It's, well, okay. What's the average poundage of a cow? Seven bucks a pound. They probably weigh 500. Of a cow. Average weight of a cow. Holy shit. A thousand? No. A bull is 2,400 pounds. 2,400 pounds? Yeah, female, 1,600. Okay, what's 1,600 times seven? What do you mean 1,600? 1,600 pounds times $7 a pound. Christ, I flunked math. Keep up, paddles. Why did you just make it 1800 Because. <laughs> it was 16 Because, because of the small cow. The oh. Small female, large cow. What's 18 large. times 7? $12,600. $12,600. So, we had 40 cows that were murdered. It's 40,000. Mm, I can't. Whatever. It's a half a million dollars. No. Okay. Yeah, 40 cows. 40 cows? Yeah. Half a million dollars? At that, 1,800 that, pounds a No, because it's yes. only worth $12,000. Uh, 12,600 times 40. Right. Half a million. Th- that's not right. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> it's a shit ton of money. This is why you're bad at math. That's not, that can't be right. That's right. 12,600 times 40. All right. This is. Wildlife officials have done everything they can to try to find the animal. They set up trail cameras and aerial flights and have still found no trace of the culprit. (laughs) It's perplexing, it's confusing, it's frustrating. Trying to figure out exactly what occurred in this incident. We have no evidence of wolves in the area. That doesn't mean they're not here, but we have no evidence. Further investigations of what may be killing the lives are still underway. Cows can develop a number of fatal diseases. Wildlife officials believed it could be clostridium bacteria, which can cause gut distress and subsequent death in cows, but veterinarians have ruled that out. 
We're scratching our heads. Although the wolves may be the cause of the death, there's little evidence. What we are lacking, in my opinion, is typical feeding behavior that we would see. Typical wolves would come back and feed on a carcass. The incident comes as gray wolves slowly come make a comeback to Colorado. Gray wolves may be used may may used to be abundant in the state before they were completely eradicated in the 1940s. So there were no wolves in the 40s until aliens came. No. Here's the other thing. They reintroduce them to other states, and then they act like the wolves know state boundaries. Right. You know, like, okay, we're only going to introduce the meerkat to Iowa. <laughs> well, you know what? The meerkat doesn't give a shit if he's in Missouri or Iowa or Kansas. No. He's going to walk wherever he wants to walk. Exactly. Colorado is aiming to implement a wolf reintroduction program approved by voters in 2020. The plan, which aims to reintroduce more wolves to the state by the end of 2023, is presented is to be presented to the CPD. This is so crazy if you've been watching Yellowstone. Yeah. Because it's all about the wolves. Wolves sometimes migrate from into Colorado from nearby states. Right. Yeah. There are likely populations from the they are likely populations from the northern Rockies across Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. If the wolves are predators responsible for the killing, it would mean they are passing through Colorado earlier than is seasonally expected. The de- decision to reintroduce the species has not always been popular. Mm-hmm. Some farmers are concerned about the wolves taking their livestock. But biologists have said the reintroduction is vital for the state's ecosystem as it would, re- it would restore predator-prey balance in the area. The presence of wolves can bring many benefits to wildland ecosystems. Their ability to thrive is directly dependent on how well they are tolerated by human populations. Colorado is also home to a variety of other species, such as the mountain lion, but officials have not confirmed whether the species is a potential suspect. One mountain lion did all this? I don't think so. I don't think so. It is not certain how many wolves are in Colorado, but they've established there's as many as six. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Whoa. In 2021, one of them gave birth to six pups. In October, three female wolves were found dead in Wyoming near the Colorado border. Officials believe they belong to Colorado's only wolf pack. Wow. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> wolves can't see boundaries, and it's easy for them to cross borders into zones where they are less tolerated. Right. That's right. What, this, this has to be like a federal thing. You can't just go, well, here's what we're going to do in our state. And then they're all running around all different states, and those people don't know they're coming. No. And if I'm a farmer and I come out and all my cows are dead, I'm going to be pissed off because, as we know, it's a ton of money. We don't know exactly how much because I don't believe your math. Right. Exactly. Um, la- one more animal story since we're on an animal train. Don't roll your eyes, paddles. This is a good story. <laughs> the Guinness World Book of Record has named this 26-year-old cat the oldest feline in the world. But she still has the personality of a kitten. Meow. You know, I... 26 years. Wow. The shit that you come up with is interesting. It's very interesting. It's her name's Flossie. She lives in of England. She's 26 is. years old. <laughs> which is about 120 in human years. You she's, read that. You didn't do that math. She's... Uh, no, I didn't do that math. I would never take credit. <laughs> um... She's the oldest one alive right now. However, 15 years ago, Cream Puff lived to be 38 years Stop. and three days in two, old in 2005. Flossie's owner, <laughs> Vicki Green. Vicky's a nice young lady. Uh-huh. Couldn't have been happier to find about the record-breaking news. I knew from the start that Flossie was a special cat, but I didn't imagine I'd share my home with a record world holder. <laughs> world record holder, she said in a statement. Although Flossie is deaf and has declining eyesight. No shit. Well... So do, so do my parents. She she looks incredibly youthful. No gray hairs for her age. And she has plenty of personality of a kitten. She's still playful, curious, and adaptive to her surroundings. Something green accredits to her early life. Flossie was formerly a stray. That's really good that a stray can live this long, too. They have a rough go of it. She's 26. You don't know when she was born if she's a stray. Well, they do. I don't know how they know. A vet can look and tell you by their teeth, usually. Huh. Yeah. She adopted Flossie in her more mature years, hopes her story will inspire others to do the same by welcoming senior cats in their home. I've always wanted to get a cat a comfortable later life. Isn't that, that is a heartwarming story. So I should have saved it to the end for our feel-good story. There's your feel-good story. It's just early. I'll read it again if I need to. Uh, okay, here's another reason you're never going to see me on a cruise ship. Well, if you do, I've been kidnapped. Or Lewis Black made me do something for an extraordinary amount of money, but I, no. I, it's not my thing. I get why people, I get why old people like it. Uh-huh. Because you don't really have to do anything. No. Just, 
Just show up at the boat. Yeah. That's all you gotta do. Nothing to think about. Get on the ship. Right. Get on the ship. Listen to this ship. My brother sent this right away, too, because he's fascinated by rogue waves. I have a whole book on rogue waves because they're out there. One person died. Dead. Really? Four others injured after a rogue wave hit the Viking Polaris cruise ship while it was sailing towards Argentina. It's with great sadness we confirmed that a guest passed away following the incident. What? You're dead. A rogue wave? Over a rogue wave. Wow. We've notified the guest families and shared our deepest sympathies. We will continue to offer full support to the family in the hours and the days ahead. Oh my God. The name and the hometown of the passenger is not released, but Argentine authorities identify her as a 62-year-old American who was hit by broken glass when the wave broke cabin windows. Oh well, I said to my brother, some of these waves can be 100 feet. Yeah. No, no lie. But even a 60-foot wave, a 30-foot wave. Yep. Imagine <laughs> some of the decks... Have little balconies. Like when I went with Lewis on those ones, we each had a little balcony. Let's say you were like, oh, I wonder what our view looks like. And you open that door and walked out and saw that. There's a 60-foot wave. Right. Even if you go back in your room, you know it's coming at you. I mean, she's only 62. The other four guests had non-threatening injuries and received treatment from doctors and medical staff on board. Rogue waves or extreme storm waves are uncommon, unpredictable, and greater than twice the size of surrounding waves. They are described as a wall of water. And um, Susie Gooding was on the ship when the incident happened, recalled that she felt like they hit an iceberg. Wow. That's how hard this thing... Everything was fine until a rogue wa- the rogue wave, and it was just sudden, shocking. We didn't know if we should get our gear and get ready for abandoning the ship. The ship sustained limited damage during the incident and arrived uh, back in port on Wednesday afternoon. We are investigating the facts surrounding this incident and will offer support to relevant authorities. Our focus remains the safety and well-being of our guests, and we're working directly with them to arrange travel return. Well, one would hope. I mean, yeah. Their next departure, the Antarctic Explorer Cruise, was scheduled uh, for December 5 through 17, was canceled due to the incident. Well... Yeah, maybe if they're yeah. using the same boat, they got to go fix the ship. That's just enough. Now you got to think about that if you're on a cruise ship. I don't like cruising, I don't like cruising either. I just but leave it all the I want to get off the ship. I don't like, I called the shower, the Chilean minor shower. I don't know how large <laughs> people. Totally, if it, yeah. It's like when they pull those Chilean miners up and it's that circular thing and they were in there like a Tootsie Pop or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, well, I don't know how bigger people um, get, get, do that. Here's another, speaking of water, let's go on a water theme here. This is unbelievable. Three people found sitting on ship's rudder survived an 11-day voyage from Nigeria. Okay, picture one of those giant container shipping ships, you know, where all they're doing is shipping shipping containers, and the rudder, which is probably the size of a building... Um, three dudes. The Spanish Coast Guard has rescued three people who were stowed on top of the rudder of a ship that arrived in the Canary Islands from Nigeria. How do you, how do you not fall off of it? Like, I don't, you have 11 days, you got to sleep and then, and it's moving. The rudder's moving. Yeah. So you just sleep, you hold on and lay down. Dehydration. Oh. That's when anybody complains about where you're living. Is it bad enough that you would get on the rudder of a ship for 11 days? I don't think so. No. So be happy about that. In a photograph distributed by the Coast Guard on Monday, the migrants are shown perched on the rudder of the oil and chemical tanker Athena II. It arrived in Las Palmas in Gran Canaria on Monday after an 11-day voyage from Lagos. It is? It says C-A-N-A. He's the prince in the Hallmark movie. He's the prince of Grand Canaria. Here's my complaint about all Hallmark Hallmark movies, Lifetime movies, and Netflix Christmas. This is about Christmas movies. Everybody from the props department should be fired. Mm -hmm. All of them. Because anytime somebody hands someone a cup of coffee, which is at least 20 times in these shows, it's clearly empty. Or hot chocolate. Or hot chocolate. It's empty. 
Yep. Nobody ho- flings coffee cups around like that because the lids never work. <laughs> That's always empty. And, and luggage. Yeah. There's clearly never anything. Right. They just fling it into the back of cars. I don't know how nobody in the props department doesn't go, oh, that looked pretty fake. Yeah, we should put real coffee, <laughs> something hot in there. Anyway. Um <laughs> The Spanish-owned Canary Islands are a popular getaway from African migrants attempting to reach Europe. Spanish data shows that migration was by sea um, jumped 51% in the first five months of the year compared to a year earlier. Last year, more than 20,000 migrants crossed from, the, crossed from the West African coastline to the Canary Islands, according to the Red Cross. More than 1,100 of those people died at sea. In 2020, four Nigerian sto- stowaways survived 10 days at sea before they were found hidden in a compartment above the rudder of a Norwegian oil tanker that had traveled from Lagos to Las Palmas. In the same year, a 14-year-old Nigerian told the Spanish paper that he hid for 15 days in a room atop the rudder of a cargo ship carrying fuel as it journeyed. They don't even have any food no. or water. No. They said they got them. They're, they're okay. They took them to a hospital. But, I mean, I don't even understand. I need these guys to write a book i need to know how you did that 11 days that's crazy it is crazy all right moving on this is um this is crazy to me now do any of you guys remember my i love true crime but i don't and i don't want to do tons of it on here because there's enough true crime podcast out there but uh i love these chips (laughs) there was a guy and I remember this because it was so random. Yep. A young guy in Florida who randomly attacked his neighbors. They were like in their 50s or 60s. Mm-hmm. And then he ate them. And when the cops arrived, he was Wait. spitting out human flesh. What? Yeah, he cannibalized them. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh. That's, uh, that's a feel-good story. This is not a feel-good story. It's not Christmas yet. It's the season. It is the season. Well, cannibalism. I'm trying to rally for the family here. Yes. It's my Christmas gift to them. Okay. Spread the word. Wow. College student Austin Haroff, 25 years old, randomly attacked John Stevens, 59, and Michelle Mishkan uh, Stevens, Ooh. age 53, in their garage in Tequesta, Florida. I don't know where that's at. I usually know. In 2016, it was found chewing on the face of one of the victims. Come on. Okay. Wait till you hear the rest of the story. I remember that because I was like, boy, you think you know your neighbors. And the next thing you know, he's a cannibal. He also seriously injured a neighbor who came to the couple's aid. He has pleaded not guilty to two counts of first degree murder and other charges. Um, Stunned family members hit out at at a plea deal was made, that he's going to go to a psychiatric ward instead of jail. But they did the plea deal without consulting the family of the victims, which I don't even know how that's legal. I don't know. I'd have to call my dad. Um, Stunned family's member hit out at the plea deal and emotional victim because he has to stay there for a minimum of six months. But if somebody says he's fine now, it's like John Hinckley Jr. It's it's up to the people at the, the, the place... If he's, they don't think he's crazy anymore. Um, That's crazy. The, the family had attempted to cast, the, this guy attempted to cast himself as a victim when really he was a cold-blooded murderer. Here we are opening the prison doors for a double murderer, the attorney said. Four words come to mind. White, rich, boy, justice. <laughs> Jody Bruce, another sister of Mishkan's, the lady, I really didn't know you could brutally murder two people and attempt to kill another and not even have a trial. That was news to me. Forensic psychologist Philip So-and-so concluded in a mental health report that Hanoff believed he was half dog, half man during the incident. He did not know the victims, and he reportedly believed that he was being chased by a demon. Haroff, who was attending Florida State University, faced up to a lifetime of imprisonment if convicted. He was found to have bought hallucinogenic mushrooms the day before the attack. Now, I can say freely, and he would not care. My friend, Ron White, loves a hallucinogenic mushroom. Yeah. But he's never tried to eat my face off. No, that'd be weird. Yep. Probably break the friendship. It would probably wreck the friendship for at least a month or so. (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay. Uh, there's all kinds of people that do mushrooms that don't do this. Before right. them, he bought them before the attack, but no traces were found in his blood. His parents told investigators their son had been acting oddly for weeks and that they had set up a mental health evaluation, but the killings took place before he could be seen. The court heard that two mental health, health experts, one for the defense and one for the prosecutors, both found that he suffered a psychotic episode during the attack and could not tell the difference between right or wrong. He will remain in the Martin County Jail until he can be transferred to a secure facility that is monitored by the state. He will not allow to be leave without a court order. The family of the victims were angry at the plea deal and gave the victim impact statements to the court. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I don't... Th- That's crazy. Okay, I mean, it's mental health, so I can't... Right. <sighs> to say... How do you ever say this guy's okay? So if he's in the, the mental health place, the mm-hmm. whatever, the psych ward, and some doctor goes, I think he's okay now. You know, that was a super weird thing that he did. Uh, yeah. But then he gets out and we're like, you know, is that funny? Is that a joke now? Because right. that's just done. Like, oh my God, remember when you were a cannibal <laughs> that one time? <laughs> well, remember when you thought you were a dog? That, that was flip, that was so crazy. Um, no, I mean, No. You, or you put him in here and you say, we're, th- we're not letting you out. Right. If, if at one point in your life, you thought you were, I mean, it's one thing if you, I don't know. Well, a couple of people I know are that mentally, where they're, they've done really off the hook things, but it yeah. didn't harm other people. Right. Yeah. Right. Like found naked, oh. outdoors, doing weird things, yeah. but alone. So, okay, but you, you're a danger to other people. I don't, I can't go along. I can't go along with that. All right, you want, you want to feel good story? This is what's going to make you feel good about the holidays. Okay. You want to feel good about the holidays? Yes. Eating potatoes could help you lose weight. Oh, yeah. Okay. See, yes. now we're on a roll. Yes. Okay. W- with little effort. Carb lovers rejoice. This delectable starch, long a guilty pleasure, just might be a secret weapon to tr- when trying to lose weight with little effort. Researchers have discovered the surprising, surprising health benefit, benefits of potatoes. As it turns out, these spuds are incredibly nutrient-dense and could be a crucial part of a healthy diet. That's how the Irish survived. Fantastic. I That's why I love them so much. Love it. It's in my DNA. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Potatoes are Um... The root vegetable has long been snubbed as too starchy for people with insulin resistance and was once thought of to be a contributor to type 2 diabetes. But the, ta- the tater's bad rap might now be rectified now that scientists claim it can be part of the ideal diet. This is great news for those who loaded up on grandma's famous mashed potatoes over Thanksgiving or, or, or who overindulge in carbs at holiday seasons, feast uh, come December and New Year's. But because the starch is low, Calorie, but very filling. Researchers found that a filling a plate full of potatoes can, can treat, contribute to a shrinking waistline. <laughs> it's like true that. because once you eat the potatoes, I don't eat anything else. You don't care about anything. No. no. People tend to eat the same weight of food regardless of the calorie content in order to feel full. By eating foods with a heavier weight that are low in calories, you may easily reduce the number of calories that you consume. The study included 36 people between the ages of 18 and 16 who were overweight, obese, or in insulin resistance. Participants were given two different diets, both high in fruits and veggies, and swapped 40% of the typical American meat consumption with beans or peas or potatoes. Beans have been touted as a diabetic, diabetes superfood, as doctors once crowned uh, beans the best at keeping blood sugar stable. But these researchers were putting that theory to the test. The key aspect of the study is that we did not reduce the portion size of the meals, but lowered their caloric content by including potatoes. Each participant's meal was tailored to their personalized cl- 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 calorie yeah. needs. I like it. Yet by replacing some meat with potatoes, participants found themselves fuller, quicker, and often did not even finish their meal. In effect, you can lose weight with little effort. Wow. That's it. Then I'm only going to eat potatoes. The potatoes <laughs> were bo- uh, the, the potatoes contain, contain vitamin C, B6, potassium, magnesium, folate, and fiber, all which promote health and have been found to have antioxidants. I don't think they know how much salt I put on them, though. The potatoes were boiled with the skins on them, and they were placed in the fridge for 12 to 24 hours to maximize their fiber. I like that. 
They were then included in lunch and dinner for the participants in the form of mashed potatoes, shepherd pie, wedges, and sca- salad and scalloped. <laughs> See? There you go. That's a happy, and I got one more for your eating on around Christmas time. Okay. Scientists share that bacon has health benefits. <laughs> Take that, Sanjay Gupta. Uh, yay. <laughs> Nobody ever says a kind word about bacon. It's always bad. It's so good. Bacon has been a beloved part of breakfast, lunch, and dinner for centuries. From bacon-wrapped hot dogs to the classic BLT sandwich, it's no surprise that bacon is one of the most popular ingredients in many dishes. But did you know there are many health benefits? I'm going to tell you what it is. Bacon is an excellent source of protein with approximately 12 grams per serving, depending on how it's cooked. In addition to protein, bacon also contains several other vitamins and minerals that help make up a balanced diet, including zinc, selenium, B3, and B12. Eating bacon also provides us with healthy fats such as mono saturated, mono non, mono unsaturated fat. That's a long ass. Mo- wow, yeah, that's a great word for Scrabble. <laughs> mono unsaturated, unsaturated fat, fat, which could help reduce the risk of heart heart disease and stroke. Wow. Mm-hmm. Nitrates. It's full of nitrates, and it's a high fat and low in carbs, which makes it an ideal choice for someone looking to lose weight or maintain a healthy weight. That's when nice. eaten as part of a balanced diet with plenty of vegetables and lean proteins, it can help reduce hunger cravings throughout the day by providing sustained energy and keeping you full longer than other foods would. So see, it's a, t- it's a, it's a win-win for the bacon and the potatoes. Nice. It's all you ever hear is bad things about the things we like. Well, there you go. Now, speaking of bad foods, would you like to win a free Mick Gold card? Do you know what a Mick Gold card is? Mick Gold? Mick Gold? Nope. Well... Sounds it, McDonald's related. Tis okay. McDonald's related. Yeah. If you have one of these, you get free McDonald's for life. Mm. Egg McMuffins. Egg McMuffins every day for you paddles. Yeah, I like that. I don't. I know. I like the cheeseburger, the kids, the regular, just a regular cheeseburger. Okay. This makes me think of this story, though, and I don't think he would care that I tell it. Uh, Jay Leno loves Burger King. Uh-huh. Well, this is from a way back, so I don't know if he still loves it, but he did for a long time. And there used to be the Burger King card. It was like a, then yeah. you got it stamped. Uh-huh. But he had eaten so much of it that he got like a gold card. Okay. I don't know what that is. And then he went down, he went down somewhere fancy mm-hmm. in, um, Los Angeles to buy Mavis, his wife, a anniversary present, uh-huh. like a piece of jewelry or something. But he was at one of those fancy stores. He said, yeah, you know, that, that was the thing, the fancy thing, and it's not the thing. And, like, none of the, Jay walks in, and he, he has one shirt, his denim shirt, <laughs> denim jeans, Canadian tuxedo every day. He never, ever wears anything different when he's off stage. That's his thing. But anyway, uh, so he picks something out, and the guy was like, oh, you know how you want to pay for it? And he said, you know, I handed him my credit card, and the, the guy came up. The guy goes, oh, excuse me, and he walked to the back. And then the boss guy came out because it's Jay, you know, and he's like, um, Mr. Leonard, <laughs> oh, no. we're really, I'm really, I'm embarrassed to say this, but we can't accept this credit card. Jay gave them his Burger King card. <laughs> 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 he meant to hand him like an Amex or something. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he goes, he goes, what do you mean? You guys aren't taking Burger King cards these days? <laughs> oh. The story made me remember that story. Um, from the McRib so called farewell tour to the Happy Meal for Grown Ups, McDonald has lately relied on limited edition promotions to entice customers. The latest promotion may be its biggest yet. The fast food giant has announced a contest during its quote season of sharing, but they didn't write out season, they put SZN. It took me a hot minute to figure that out while I pre read this article. Um, yeah, it's a promotional event where the grand prize is a lifetime supply of McDonald's. The winner of the contest will receive the iconic McGold card, which entitles them to two McDonald's meals per week for 50 years, a grand total of 5,200 meals. The McGold card was once reserved for high-profile celebrities with reported owners including billionaires Warren Buffett, Oh. And Bill Gates, as well as actor Rob Lowe. Wow. How random. Rob Lowe. And you don't have to give it to Warren. He's going every day. Right. He's, he he's, 
Like well, he's a, he's a routine guy. I think he's a spectrum guy. He yeah. like his routine in Omaha. I went to I drove right up to his house and then I drove his route to his McDonald's and I know where he works. It's all public information. I wasn't stalking him. I don't even know if he was home. I just wanted to see right. what his day was like every single day. I wouldn't have given Warren a thing because A, he doesn't need it, and B, he's coming anyway, every day. I don't know about Bill Gates. He doesn't look like a McDonald's guy. I don't know about Rob Law. Anyway, the winner will be able to select three friends who will each receive a McGold card as well. So if you win, our fans have been fascinated by the lure of the McGold card, (laughs) and if it really exists, McDonald's chief of marketing Marketing officer Tarek Hassan said in a statement, now we'll make this McDonald's legend a reality for our fans by giving them the ultimate holiday gift, a chance to win a card, and then share access with it to three or four, oh, sorry, to three of their family or friends. There are two main ways to enter the lifetime supply of McDonald's. Customers who have the McDonald's app. See, it always leads back to their apps. Yeah. All things lead back to apps. download our app. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Customers who have the app on their phone and are enrolled in the My McDonald's Rewards program will receive an entry on the sweepstakes each time they make a purchase during the duration of the contest. It goes from December 5th to the 25th, up to once a day. To enter the contest without making a uh, purchase, entrants can visit the link. They put a link in here. Starting on December 5th, provide their email address, phone number, date of birth. This can be done once a day for the duration of the contest. We'll put it in the notes. Yeah. Go ahead. Termites, try. Let's do it. Let's see if anybody can get it done. I don't think I'll be able to get it done because it's too technical. I can't do all that. That's awesome. Well, I don't like McDonald's enough. If it was Taco Bell, I would try. Maybe Arby's. Wendy's. I just, McDonald's, I don't. You do it for Arby's. I eat McDonald's when there's nothing else when it's there. But I know I like Chick-fil-A, but the line's too long. And then, I don't know. There's so many people get mad at Chick-fil-A. The funniest joke ever, though, is Ch- George Wallace's joke about Chick-fil-A. He goes, they, you know, Chick-fil-A, oh, they're not going to be open on Sundays. They said, never going to be open on a Sunday, which is nice for the employees, I guess. But he goes, uh, so I have, I got a great idea. On Saturday, I'm going to go up to the Chick-fil-A by my house and buy everything they have. And then I'm going to sit in that drive through on Sunday and resell it for double. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me Chick-fil-A is not open on Sunday. It is this Sunday. It's going to have a sign out front that said, we are open now. <laughs> it's going to be me at a card table. Totally. <laughs> so funny. Uh, this story I love because, well, wait, I got to do it, but the NFL Pokemon guy. Yeah. <sighs> so many things. I did know there were Pokemon cards. I don't even understand what Pokemon is. Is it a cartoon? I think the Asians liked it as a cartoon. The Asians liked it as a cartoon. The yeah. Asians in Asia. Yeah. It started in Asia, right? Yeah. Um, um, so there's this guy, NFL player. His name's Blake Martinez. He found himself for a, st- um, uh, a second act for former Pro Bowl players go as a second act. It's hard to beat collecting and flippy po- Pokemon cards worth six figure sums it's certainly better than getting jerked around by lousy teams which is where Blake Martinez found himself for a second straight year at the end of October the seventh year linebacker out of Stanford sold a rare Pokemon card at auction for six hundred and seventy two thousand dollars wow now again what do you what do you do with it well, it's better than an NFT. It's actually physically an item. But do you carry it in your purse and show people at a bar? Hey, look what I got. Right. I can tell you no one at my bar would know what the fuck that is. No. <laughs> and I'm sure racist things would be said yes. while I pulled that out. Yeah. By the old guys. <laughs> Ten days later, Martinez, 28, a starter who had just signed with the Vegas Raiders, he retired from the NFL. Ten days after selling it. Did pocketing six hundred grand for a Pokemon card really sway the football player into retirement? We've reached out to ask him directly, but frankly, it seems very plausible considering his specific circumstances. Anyway, um, the timeline, he started collecting these a long time ago when he was a kid. Um, it's, oh my God. He said, look what I found in my basement. 
he said on Instagram, brandishing Swirlustrator, an extremely rare Japan-only holographic card starring Pikachu. Professional grade sayers, fewer than 40 are known to exist. Uh, it was in his basement. Yeah, he uh, collected them. Uh, he began collecting them as a kid, and then during COVID, he got more back into it because he had more time. Sure did. Um, when he revealed the card, we've asked to actually how he actually acquired it and for how much. He was still a member of the Giants, the football Giants. Mm-hmm. He had torn ligaments in three games into the twenty-one season and headed into training camp in the third year of a thirty million dollar contract with the Giants. However, only nineteen was guaranteed. And with that already paid, it meant the Giants could cut him as if he was a rookie trying to make the team, so they did. Um, he said he began collecting when he was six years old, got away from the hobby, got back into it during COVID. He's just a smart person, though. Yeah. If you got $672,000 and you're still getting your brains bashed in at, at, on these football teams that aren't paying you shit, yeah, you quit. You can't retire on $672,000, not as a young man. No, he's so young, but... You could go do something else. Take that money and then go buy a house, and now you can be a football coach at a high school or something. Yeah. Um, I, he first went to his childhood collection but discovered that his mom, in his story so common, it's almost cliche, had given or thrown them away. He got serious enough about collecting Pokemon cards that he started a breaks business. A breaks business is a dealer... A dealer solicits buyers for a box of unopened cards, then opens them, and then the buyers are awarded the contents. The opening is usually done in an online event. Through this, he met the dealer of rare items. He printed me a bunch. Of, he presented me a bunch of different trophy cards, and the Swirlustrator was one of them. He didn't say how much he paid for it. So he got a deal with the Raiders, but it was it's for one point one million. I mean, his Pokemon cards almost that. Right. Well, half, more than half. None of that was guaranteed, that money. Then he came back with the thing, and then he quit. I just think that's a great, take the money and run while you still have your brain. You know, and you're not hurt. You're up, God knows what could happen out there. For (laughs) shitty money, I'm not playing football. For great money, I'm thinking about it. All right, but not enough. There's plenty of other jobs out there. He could come on the road and sell merch for me. (laughs) (laughs) We got um, all right, this is kind of a fun, we'll call it, I'll call it a feel-good story. Okay. Okay? This is what we're going to sign off on. Okay. And then we're going to have a wonderful Christmas day. De- now that I'm off work, I can go hang Christmas lights for real. As soon as it stops raining, fucking snowing, all that shit. Um, yeah, but this is more rain than snow. Yeah, so... Um, the World Cup's still going, and there's a game this afternoon. This is, I love the idea of this, and it seems to be true. And I think it's because I'm nearly, if I was amongst these people, it would be the only time I would be a living giant. The mysterious people of diminutive stature who inhabited Saqqara Bray 5,000 years ago. I have no idea what you just said. I know. Saqqara Bray is an island. Stories about a dwarf species of human being have been circulated for a long time. However, they've often been dismissed as ancient fiction. The discovery of a hobbit-like human species approximately the size of a three-year-old. Whoa. What? Whoa. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Yes. Uh, the discovery of a hobbit-like human species apparently the size of a three-year-old in 2004 has had researchers and naysayers alike rethink the fact that little people did actually exist and thrive in various parts of the world, like Scotland, Hawaii, and Indonesia. We've wow. talked about the ones in Asia, Indonesia on this podcast because they yeah. keep they found the skeleton. I also think Ireland, because if you go to Ireland, they have these things called beehives. It has nothing to do with bees, but it looks like a beehive. It's a gray, round structure that points up to a top. They're very tiny. And that's where the ancient people would live in. But the running joke is, hey, wow, this is uh, built for me. Right. Like, my brother-in-law, Matt, can't even get in it. Just right. the doorway itself. And then if he stood up, he's six foot two. Right. Forget it. I'm like, five foot tall must have been, yeah. we're just going to build it in case a giant comes. <laughs> but it is not the norm. These people had to be super duper duper tiny. Uh, 
I don't know about this, but tiny, wow. but <laughs> this dig that this is. Sakara Bray, located, I might be saying that wrong, located in the Scottish Orkney Archipelago, the islands. Archipelago. Archipelago. Yep. Um, the settlement consists of a cluster of eight prehistoric dwellings that have had people scratching their heads on an account of its dimensions, as this excerpt explains. These eight little dwellings came ple- complete with stone beds, a central hearth, shell midden insulation, and indoor toilets draining outwards from the structure. But most interesting of all are the dimension of the doors and the beds. The doorways and the beds barely reach four feet. And so the only logical conclusion to make from these dimensions is that the inhabitants were indeed diminutive in stature. That's why I never understood. Why is nobody talking about the, the beehives? If you go to the Southwest of Ireland, you go out of the peninsula, they're just in people's backyards. Right. They're just there. And like one guy has a sign beehives here. See, <laughs> see for five pounds. Right. And you walk up and knock on his door and you give him five bucks. Go. And he goes, dad, are up there. Be careful now. Don't fall. <laughs> careful on the rocks. <laughs> and then you just go up and look at them. They don't like go super overboard and protect it. At least uh, they didn't back in the day, but I don't know. Really. But you're like, well, if people lived it, and there's clearly a middle, like for a fireplace, and then there's a hole up top yep. for the smoke. Right. What's right. even stranger is that these Neolithic homes were located underground. <laughs> what? Why are they going underground? Wow. Per reports, they were hidden under a mound until a great storm annihilated it in 1850. How smart is that, though? Wow, yeah. That's really smart. Like a bear, they went in a, in a cave. It was not until 1927 that these dwelling, dwellings were officially investigated, and even them, then the mystery deepens, as this excerpt explains. Then the site was allegedly looted of many artifacts in 1913, and it was not officially studied until 1927 by the University of Edinburgh. Professor Gordon, somebody, came to the feeble conclusion that the site dated to 500 B.C., but this was obviously incorrect, and in the 70s, material from the site was carbon dated to 3,180 B.C. Yep. The manuscript written by the Bishop of Orkney in 1493 suggests that when the king of Norway, Harold Hafaga, Hafaga, conquered Orkney in the 19th century, in the 9th century, sorry, it was inhabited by short Statured Papaye people and the Picts who were uh, exterminated by persons of unknown. In his book titled From Eternal Influences on English from its beginnings of the Renaissance, the priest Scandinavian inhabitants of Orkney were Pape, which means clerics, and Pate, which means Picts, so ancient Roman called the tribes of today's Scotland who were a race of small statured people. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. The size of a three-year-old. Full-grown people. That's crazy. And I mean, I know little people. Brad Williams, my friend, the comedian, very funny. You should go see his shows. He's great. But he's taller than that. Yeah. Than a three-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. And he's he's a little person. Yeah. I just think it, I think it would be phenomenal. Maybe yeah. it's because I'm only five foot tall. Just having them around yeah. to talk to and stuff. Yeah, I want to go in their underground cave. Where do you guys party at night? You could almost fit. <laughs> <laughs> I can fit in the beehives, and I would be totally comfortable in a beehive. I mean, I'd be freezing my ass off, but as far as height goes, fine. <laughs> but I could only have people in there that were my size. No big people. My brother-in-law, no. not invited. <laughs> Even my sister's kids with my brother-in-law, they're all going to be tall. Nope, nope, you are not of the Madigan clan, the, the prehistoric diminutive people that we are. It's a shoddy potty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right, termites. Um, you know, have fun at the holidays. For my Jewish friends, you do your thing. Lewis is Jewish, but he loves, um, he acts like he doesn't, but he loves Christmas parties. Because he just, yeah. he's a food monster. Yeah. yeah, he's a food and wine monster. Uh-huh. He'll go to anything. Uh-huh. Like on Christmas, he's such a whore. He'll make the rounds to like five places. He doesn't <laughs> stay long. <laughs> he gets too excited knowing that there's food somewhere else. Right. I'm like, we're here. Right. Eat this. Nope. Like, 
yeah, I know, but I heard uh, Willie's doing a whole pig, and you know, like he's got <laughs> menus from everybody's house of what they're doing. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, that's it, termites. I'm gonna be watching um, George and Tammy about Tammy Wynette. I'm going to be watching my Hallmark movies and yelling at the prop department for not putting coffee in coffee cups. And the, the World Cup, Tommy Salami, football. Tommy had a wonderful comeback last night. <laughs> oh, Tommy. God, he saved the game with two minutes left. Just, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's God. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I got to get, uh, he's got to get off the fantasy team. Sorry, Tommy. Uh, no, nah, he's not getting any points. Nope. And I'm climbing my way. I was in seventh, and now I'm in fifth. Nice. I need to make it in the playoffs, yep. which means I have to dump him. Um, football, and uh, I think that's all that I got queued up. I'm going to be watching that documentary I told you guys about, Moment of Contact, about um, the Brazilian UFO effort, uh, sighting, but I didn't have time to watch it, but I'm going to. That's great. Mm-hmm. You like those chips. I love these chips. Mm-hmm. I have to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. All right. That's really all I got, Termites. Happy December. It was a very, 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 very exhausting weekend. So if I seem a little tired, that's why. I need me No, I have a World Cup game coming on. Ah! All right. That's it. Night, Termites.